Welcome back, everyone. We're going to continue our conversation, um, just sort of an informal group discussion about this state of AI report. So we started it last time. Here you can see the different topics. Uh, we'll see how many we get to. We're not necessarily going to go through um, all approximately 100 slides on here. Uh, we started talking about uh, research last week. Okay, so they had their predictions for 22. At the end, they have predictions for this coming year, so that'll be fun. Um, and and we talked a little bit last week about, hey, GPT-4 is still the best LLM out there, okay? And RLHF uh, be became something that many people had not heard of and became, like, in the mainstream, right? But um, uh, people are still trying to see if they can... They can um, build good models, good chat models without using RLHF, okay? So they're still looking at alternatives. Um, and uh, and uh, but what I think most people know is that now there's all these different models. So Llama was really the, the watershed event because not only did you have an architecture, but you actually had weights that were released. However it is that the weights got released, uh, but now people are taking Llama models, they're fine-tuning them, they're building other things and whatnot. And so now uh, there's tons and tons of open source activity, tons and tons of commercial activity, private activity on uh, building small models. And the focus has gotten a lot more on the quality of, of the data versus the um, number of parameters in your model. So you may not be able to build a model that does as well on every single possible task under the sun as GPT-4. But if you just need a model to do good question answering for the line of tractors that you make, you may be able to build one that's really, really good, that's a lot smaller, uh, with good quality data, with good fine tuning techniques. So this is, I think, approximately where we got to last week. Um, the research part is, is still um, heavily tilted towards LLMs. And so I think we'll just kind of continue from here. So let's see here. So yeah, so Llama set off a race of open or not completely open, open-ish, um, smaller large language models. So they mention a few of them on here, um, Mosaic ML, Falcon, Pythia, um, I don't know exactly which ones are open, like Vicuna is another one I've heard of. There's there's a bunch. There's more recent ones than I'm sure uh, um, than this report. There's a gazillion out there. Anybody want to, any comments about uh, sort of, there's a gazillion smaller LLMs now? So... Ted, I just have one question. I, I don't know if anybody's um, run across this, but what I've seen is that smaller models are performing as good as some of the larger previous models, right? Um, on, say, maybe a single task, not on all tasks. Right. What I'm wondering is, um, is there still the, the strong association with size? In other words, um, you know, we might have on a particular task, a 7B model is as good as chat GPT 3.5, which is what, like 150 or something like that? Um, billion parameters, I think. Yeah, they never so. officially told us. Okay. Um, what, uh, but what I'm wondering is, it, like if I have a 7B that's as good as, if I go to a 40B, does it scale? Does the quality kind of scale with the size? Or is that association not necessarily been found yet? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I ahead, think Jerry. some of the llama ones have. There's like a llama 7B, a llama 15, and a 40 or something like that. Uh -huh. And I think they do get better as they, you know, get a little larger. But the curve shallows fairly quickly. You know what I mean okay. in terms okay. in terms of the improvement curve. Um, and I, yeah, I haven't heard them push that particular one beyond there. Okay, um, we don't know then, like with the the ChatGPT three point five versus four, yeah. we don't know or, the size of those, so we don't know if the curve kind of was flattening out there or not. I guess, huh? Yeah, there's um, a lot of things we don't know, like the size, the amount of training data, 
the yeah. types of training data, how they're how much fine tuning they're doing. There's so many things unknown. But yeah. but generally speaking, uh, if you want to say for your business have a chat bot that can do tech support basic questions, right? Uh -huh. You're going to fine tune it depending on what technique you use or multiple techniques you use. You might use a combination of RLHF and traditional, you know, straight fine tuning, whatever. Um, I think what most people would do is they say, I'm going to try and see if the 7 billion could do it. And if it can't, then you try the 13 and then you try, you know, work your way up to the 50 or the 70 billion, right? Uh, okay. Because it's just going to be faster, cheaper, you know, whatever. But I, I've not heard anybody say that when fine-tuned on my company's proprietary data, the 13 billion performed worse than the 7 billion. Yeah. I haven't heard that. I, I wouldn't expect that, but just wondering if there is kind of a, a generally accepted scaling law of some sort. So um, I think it's entirely possible that for a small task like, like, like let's say question answering on my company's products, mm -hmm. that might be a small enough task that it is more dependent on the quality of your data than whether you use the, the 7B or the 13B. Yeah. If okay. you start yeah. doing things like a chat bot that's supposed to be able to handle longer conversations, you're probably gonna run into needing a bigger model, right? If you do anything that involves analytical thinking, you know, like those eighth grade math word problems. Oh yeah, I got two of these the, and the I biggest two one. More. You know, I don't know why you would need that for your proprietary application, but you may find that 70 billion is not good enough. No, no. You may find that chapter the GPT 3.5 is not good enough, that you really need GPT 4 to even come close. Oh, no, no, no. It's now it's GPT 4 turbo. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. That's the new so, one. So the, then one other related question would be um, it seems like the hallucinating, when I played with it at least, the hallucinating is the most um, difficult problem. Uh, it interferes with its ability to you know, be deployed. Um, and I'm wondering, is there, um, is there any, are they seeing better? My understanding is for GPT-4 is better at not hallucinating. Is that true or is that a? I think, I think that's a correct statement, Roger. And so in the, the smaller models chain, trained on a higher quality, small, smaller data set, are they able to still get the improvement in the hallucinating or not hallucinating? Don't know. I, I think okay. my personal opinion on this might be slightly different from like the conventional wisdom. Okay. I, I personally think that the, that the concept of hallucination is, uh, is not well defined and not well understood. Okay? okay. So for me, all models make mistakes. So if you have a model that predicts housing prices, sometimes it'll just be wrong. We don't use a pejorative term like hallucination when our housing model like picks a price that's too high or too low for a house, you know? So sometimes these models will predict the uh, a very poor next word next token okay what these llms seem to share in common is that once you pick a bad next token you often don't recover from it hmm. okay so yeah. i think that gpt4 does better in terms of factual things so if you want to know where was george washington's grandson born like that's not necessarily a super readily available fact that all models are going to get right but gpt4 might be more likely to get it right okay and if you do analytical reasoning it's more likely to get it right the problem with things like analytical reasoning is once you once they kind of make a misstep so like i was just helping my daughter with physics and there was this problem that says like you have a satellite orbiting mercury and it's X many meters above the surface. So the R that you're supposed to use in the physics formula isn't that number above the surface. You have to add how far the surface is from the center of the planet. So mm -hmm. you add those two numbers to the R, right? So for example, if the LLM doesn't 
output the word plus or the 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 the, the symbol plus after it outputs the first number, it's dead. If it outputs the plus, then it's going to output the, the second number most likely, and then it, it'll, it'll then continue to do the logic. But once it misses on that plus sign, then that's the phenomenon we see is that they don't tend to recover from that. Interesting. So you think of hallucinating hallucinations more as just that how a poor prediction of a next token manifests itself. It just is an error kind of. Yeah, yeah. So, so are you familiar with like dead reckoning, like when yeah. you're on a boat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you're if you're just supposed to be heading due west and you're off by one degree, after mm -hmm. several hours, you're off by a lot. And yeah. then your one degree can compound and then you might be off by three degrees if, if, you're, if your errors don't cancel each other out, right? Right. And right, so yeah. you can end up just... <clears throat> hundreds of miles from where you're supposed to be. That's the thing is once you pick one bad token, it's like you made this dead reckoning error. And in yeah. a perfect world, you would just self-correct back to the, the, the true compass heading. But that's not what seems to happen. Is once, you, once you make a mistake, you just keep veering off into the wide, deep blue. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I've never heard it kind of presented that way, but that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good presentation. So, so now everybody may not agree exactly with that interpretation, but but so so you kind of need to say, well, with from hallucinations, what exactly are you talking about? Are you talking about factual errors, sort of analytical errors, mm -hmm. or there's this other category which which I call the pleasing the user errors? Okay. So mm -hmm. let's say there are no papers whatsoever on the internet about um, George Washington's grandson, okay? If you say to, to, to an LLM, please give me three web references about the life of George Washington's grandson, they will likely hallucinate three fake URLs, okay? The life and times of Bob Washington by so and so da 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 URL da 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 right, and so that's a that's this weird kind of hallucination that is very unique to LLMs in that the instruction following is strong enough that they don't really want to say I, I, I don't know the answer to that I don't have any websites right. for you yeah mm -hmm. okay. So that's where people do like prompt engineering and stuff to try to tell it, you know, if you don't have any, just just tell me that don't actually make them up or whatever. But so I, I feel like when you ask about hallucination, like we do, I, I feel like we need to be more specific on the types of errors that these LLMs make in order to say which one's stronger, or weaker in terms of X, Y, and Z. Right. And I, I guess it would follow then if you follow that line of reasoning that a small model that's supposed to be good at a smaller task, more specific task, this quote unquote hallucination, whatever it's defined as, um, is going to be less likely because it's performing better. It's predicting better in that smaller domain. Yeah, in the small domain. I think in general, you can say the small models are more likely to make all the kinds of mistakes. They have less factual information because right. they don't have any rights right. to store that. They're less like, right. But... It can be the case that, like you're saying, that for this this small domain, answer questions about my series of, of tractors that my company makes, they may tend to not hallucinate if, if you know, that's what they're doing. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. And then I assume there'll be slides coming up that talk about, like, retrieval as a way to address that also. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I, I and I'm, uh, this is my understanding, you know, even though smaller models compared to their uh, larger size siblings will perform relatively worse, but when you compare those across different families of models, like a 7 billion Mistral AI would perform or is performing better than, let's say, Llama to uh, 70 billion, right, which was doing pretty good. And in, uh, in the spider chart that I shared last week on Slack channel, apparently it was doing better than GPT-3.5 as well. I, I, I don't recall. Maybe I'm again mistaking 
uh, for what it was doing. But definitely, you know, there are some improvements that they continue to along the way, either in terms of the data training, data set that is used for training, the quality of that, or uh, I'm not sure if they're doing many changes. Well, Lama 2 did have some changes in the architecture, uh, specifically in terms of the uh, layer normalization that it used uh, and the uh, position encoding that it used. And apparently that led to better results. So it's a multitude of things that come into play, uh, which helps improve the performance. Uh, but within the family, definitely, you know, 7 billion is a smaller size model in the same family performs not as good as the bigger size. Uh, and sometimes they don't even release the mod. Like there is somehow a established trend now, like a 7 billion, 13 billion, uh, 34 billion and 70 billion. Those are like four numbers that people tend to are sticking to. I have no idea why those four numbers, but for some reason, those are four numbers that almost every model releases. Very rarely do you see like Mosaic MPT 30 billion and Falcon 40 billion and 180 billion Falcon, which you see in the second bullet. Those are not that common sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are instances where, for example, in Lama 2 case, they did not release initially 34 billion because uh, in some setting somewhere or some article somewhere people found that it was performing worse. So the overall, you know, why and how, maybe still not all well understood, but as a general trend, that's what people have observed and noticed. So if I can make sort of a, like a slight observation on kind of hallucinations. Um, um, which like I've always sort of understood as as um as kind of having sort of incorrect information per se. Um, there could be other sort of shortcomings and, and, and with um, but like I understood it as just saying specifically saying things that are wrong. And I guess what I, what I kind of noticed with with just using it a bit is that there, there could be and one of the challenges I think is that there could be ways to kind of uh, reduce the, the probability of saying um, incorrect things um, at the cost of other other um, of other factors that make them sort of less friendly to users or less capable of of um, of, of of doing what users would like. Like for example, I've I've noticed kind of more recently after like after you know the news spread about sort of hallucinations and things like that, a lot of Sort of my chats from like you know being chat from, with GPT four. It might it it's often, for example, kind of like almost quoting verbatim sections of of text that that come that I can find on the internet. Um, and the more it's either trained, um, you know, like from reinforcement learning to do those kind of things, that can potentially you know reduce the chance of sort of hallucination, but might come at the cost of, for example. Um, you know, giving the user too much jargon. If the user isn't 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 that familiar with it, and you're just given you're kind of quoting verbatim from technical sources, it might kind of lead to more questions that the user has. Or, for example, it might if it does that, then it might leave a few steps uh, of reasoning out, and I have to prompt it for, for for kind of more times and read it, and then prompt it to to actually complete the reasoning to answer a question that I had. Um, and so I think that's kind of where 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 the challenge lies that if if you want something you know apply to this technology to a to a like to product to help end users then um how that kind of um you know how that kind of you know how you adapt the technology for that becomes a challenge as well i think mm -hmm. yep thanks alan yeah so so today like if you're going to build something you still need to try different models you should try different families because, you know, whatever, Mistral, Vicuna, um, you know, Llama 1, Llama 2, right? All 7 billion, you may see d different performance on certain kinds of tasks, especially the ones that are more, I don't know what to call it, more to the edges, you know? So if it involves code, 
definitely some models are going to do way better than others. You know, if it involves arithmetic, some are going to do way better than others, that kind of a thing. If it's just question and answering about tractors, maybe they all do similar. I don't know. All right, let's keep going. I have not read this, so I don't know what all the upcoming slides are. We very well may be covering those topics. Like the next slide could be about hallucinations for all. Hey, I have a question about fine tuning, actually. Yeah. Um, so if you take, you know, any of these small models, like 7 billion, I'm wondering how much resources it takes to fine tune. Do you need hundreds? So I don't know if I can highlight it or if it's just going to go to the next slide when I try to click on it. Uh, but you'll see that there is a mention right here, if you can see my mouse, mm -hmm. of... The low rank one? Nope. It just, yeah. I'm in presentation mode, so now it just advances when I try. But so, so Laura, QLaura, and, and these other parameter efficient things, um, Roger, thank you for covering that. Um, did a couple weeks a little ways back. Um, the, they've been huge because traditional fine tuning, right? You basically for every for every parameter you need to store the parameter, you need to store its gradients. Uh, if you're using Atom, Atom has two things that it tracks. I can't remember exactly what, but for momentum or whatever, um, so like mean and standard deviation or something like that equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, so I forget the math, but it works out to something like six times or whatever you know and then how many bytes per uh so if you're doing 16 bit then you need to double it right so if you have mm. four things and they're each 16 bit floats then that means that one parameter is going to take eight bytes so your seven billion parameter model is going to need 56 billion that uh, 56 gigs of ram <laughs> so oh, uh, what about gpu yeah, that's what I'm saying. On, on a GPU, you're going to need 56 oh, gigs on a, G okay. on a GPU, right? So you need these parameter-efficient fine-tuning methods to say, no, 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 you're still going to need the 7 billion, and if you're storing them as 1 byte weights, then you'll need 7 gigs. If you're storing them as 2 byte weights, you know, B floats, whatever, you'll, you'll need 14. You can afford 14 gig, right? But we're going to have a smaller number of trainable parameters, and those will have the times 8 or whatever you need for them. And so if you only have 10 million trainable parameters, I don't care about multiplying that by eight. I'll, I'll easily, you know, throw 80 megabytes of fine tuning at something. So definitely the, 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 the parameter efficient, the PEFT domain has made this so much more reachable than um, when we people were doing full fine tuning of all the weights. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I mean, like, I saw... Sorry, go yeah, ahead. If you look at yeah, if you look at the the QLaura stuff, um, that's where you get the answer to that question. But it basically gets to where all of these models you can do these um, uh, parameter efficient fine tuning on single GPU very mm -hmm. easily. Uh, and you're, yeah, you're training a, a small percentage of uh, the parameters, and and so it doesn't take uh, you know as much data. Um, it it really makes it easy to uh, fine tune for your specific task. I see. Interesting. Because I came across like a company that was offering, you know, this fine tuning. Hmm. Basically, their their stick was, you know, we'll use, I forget what, Llama or something. And then, you know, give us your data or we can put it on prem and we can fine tune it for your data so we don't take anything from you. So just wondering the viability of that sort yep, of company. Absolutely. It, so if you're interested in pursuing that further, Janet, just um, uh, you know, reach me offline and we can kind of dive into that. But it, okay. uh, it's easy to do. You, you can spin up a, um, a machine. Okay. Google, Google Compute, really easy. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So then let's see, what's next? Okay, uh, so Llama 2 is fairly recent as of publishing of this report. I mean, there's like new ones coming out every week, but still pretty re recent. And so I think right now, uh, Dave, I don't know if you have any thoughts otherwise, but like Llama 2 is pretty competitive on how it performs on different tasks. Yes, it is pretty good. 
uh, I downloaded all four versions and uh, if you are doing the inferencing, you don't need the gradient parameters. So then for inferencing, you, I tried it on my dual 4090s and as long as the context size was limited for 70 billion, for other models, it worked fine. And it was very good for what I was, you know, uh, what I use it for. One thing, and maybe they'll cover it. In future. Oh, they do have it here, Code Llama, right? In the fourth, third bullet. Yeah. Uh, so the out, so, the, so when they talk about LLMs, essentially they talk about two or three different things. One is the pre-trained model. So typically what people download is a pre-trained model. Uh, and then it is fine-tuned for chat or something else. So you would typically see two different models. And then for code, there is yet another model. In this case, it's called Code Llama. So in some ways, even though like, you know, GPT-4, we go to one chat and it is instructed to do whatever we ask it to do. And it does all of it in one chat uh, interface. For Llama, for different use cases, you end up, well, GPT-4 also for that matter, uh, it is initially pre trained uh, on the data set and then the chat uh, tuning is done. Uh, and that's what is used for multiple use cases based on the instruction uh, fine tuning that it has, that has been done on it. For Llama, essentially there are different models that you can download. You can download the pre-trained model and then fine tune for whatever you, your use cases are. Uh, you can do the supervised fine tuning on your data set and so on and so forth. Uh, Code Llama is a separate model by itself, which, so I think it says somewhere here, they used 1.5 trillion or 2 trillion tokens to train base model, and then another half a trillion tokens to train Code Llama. So that was a very heavy duty training on top. Uh, another thing to be a little bit careful about, Jayant, in terms of fine tuning is, uh, so typically you fine tune for a specific task and also you want to be careful about, uh, one needs to be careful about what mode uh, of Llama model are you fine tuning? Model? Oh, I, I, so when I say I did, I did also fine tune it for a specific use case. I have a repository that I created, which if you are interested, you can go and take a look. I meant to, presented here, but I haven't gotten around to do it uh, at this forum. But I, I fine-tuned the chat model because to try to fine-tune with the data set that I have, the pre-trained model, that typically doesn't work well. And essentially what happens is if you have your own data set and you're trying to fine-tune the pre-trained model with that data set, it tends to forget the trillions of tokens of training that it was trained on originally and kind of messes up the overall uh, uh, knowledge that it has. Instead, if you have a chat-based model, which is already fine-tuned for a specific task, and then you train it to just enhance it to chat on your data set, uh, fine-tuned for that, that tends to work pretty well uh, for that specific subtask. So uh, I don't know, I made several points and I hope those make sense uh, in general at a high level. Uh, but one thing to be careful about fine tuning is that if you want to make it domain specific, you have to then end up, uh, you know, making sure that it is a very <laughs> comprehensive domain specific training. If it is a simple chat data set training, that it, uh, you know, generally works better uh, on top of the chat models. Dave, yeah, does that's that hold, useful? Does that hold also for like the code model? I mean, if you wanted to switch from I don't know, Python to C++ or something like that. Would the code yeah, model think, be the one you started with? Yeah, I don't know uh, too many details on that, but I would imagine it may have some constraints because the code llama one is, if I'm not mistaken, trained on Python, Java, and C++, maybe other languages as well, but mm -hmm. definitely those three. I'm just I've wondering if, if it already has... You yeah. know, if you think about it from a developer standpoint, you're used to things like delimiters, uh, you know, assignment, assignment symbology, you know, whatever 
mathematical operations and things like that that may not be as prominent in other type of models as they would in like a code model. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you're doing code, it's been trained on multiple different languages, but I have heard people do just a very small amount of fine tuning if you know you only want one language. So if you That's only right. want Python, then they just do a tiny bit of fine tuning on only Python code. It's It'll mm. work well out of the box, but it just itty bitty better performance um, because you're, you're okay with it forgetting <clears throat> a little bit about Java and other stuff. Yeah, but the other thing is too, you know, any sort of language is going to have libraries thrown on top of it, right? You know, Python has a library for this and that and everything else. And I, how much of those have they trained it on? Or is that something where you take like the base one and then you train it on, you know, your corporate's library type thing, Python library? So I, I would speak imagine... other languages. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry, uh, Ted. Yeah, so I was just going to say that like, specifically Python, Java, and some of these other languages. Uh, I, I, so there, there, there are two things or two different kinds of products. If you're using products like this one, right, like Code Llama, then it will be limited by the knowledge it has been trained on in terms of the libraries it has been trained on. Uh, definitely, you know, if there is a new library that came out or package that came out two weeks ago, it will not have knowledge of that versus what I often tend to do is to go to Bing GPT, which is a retrieval access generative model, which essentially uh, is slightly different. It does use GPT-4 as the backbone, but in terms of the data, it has access to the latest data as well from search engines, right? So, but on top of that, that GPT code is also, I'm not answering your question directly, but I'll come to that. But uh, uh, G Bing GPT is able to then get the latest library information, maybe even have access to some of the code uh, also, uh, and then also knows how to write Python code. And if you ask it to give you, you give you a code for a specific library, which is newer, it can potentially give you that. If Code Llama was to ask to do that, it won't be able to do that. First of all, it may not have access to, or it may not have been trained on that new library, and then it may mm. start hallucinating potentially. Now, okay. if you want to fine tune it or provide that library as the input for it to work with and then do it, then uh, potentially it can do it. Now, to your question about a newer uh, language, uh, I, I think I recall now that I've seen, as Ted mentioned, that someone tried it on some, I forget the name, MPL or, or some, some language, they tried it on and gave a few examples, maybe 200 or 300 examples. And then it started spitting out code. But it was very rudimentary in the sense that they gave it very few examples, 200, 300 examples. It cannot be very comprehensive unless you have... Sure. Dave, I, th Dave, I think you dropped out there. Yeah, I think so it's... I can Dave, we're sorry. losing your audio. You were good for a long time, but now you're breaking up. I don't know if your internet's slow. Yeah, I'll maybe mute. Maybe that's a sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I was just I was just wondering because you know uh, there are languages that it's probably not trained on, but they're still for whatever reason still being used. Things like you know COBOL, unbelievably, is still being used. People are getting paid good money to do that. It seems like you know just the pool of COBOL developers has to be shrinking just by attrition over time. <laughs> and I was wondering if these people that still have to maintain these ancient systems could, you know, use something like this. I, hey, I suspect someone, you, some... you're not going to have any difficult with like <laughs> COBOL or Fortran or something like that. Um, I guess like if you found some like old obscure language that does something very different, like say reverse Polish notation for math instead of infix. Yeah. Right. If you use postfix, that uh -huh. might really screw these things up because almost all languages these days use infix notation. You know. Yeah. Uh, and then there's but, always like you know symbolic language like APL or something like that. Right? That's so, what I was thinking. I don't know APL yeah. well enough. I don't remember. So so I don't remember what it, what is in there. But like uh, yeah, 
So, so COBOL, I don't think it's going to be a problem because it really only needs to know a few keywords and then the rest of it, you know, follows a pretty simple grammar. Yeah, yeah, it has like, e, you know, it has E, Q, U, I, L, you know, for equals, those sort of things and uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, I was wondering, and then there's like, you know, APL, that was one that was popular. There are some, but there are variants that are still being used for, you guys know I work in kind of the small processor space and you know in the small processor space they have a lot of add-on things that take up very very small amounts of memory for various reasons and they sort of screw with the syntax in various languages so interesting yeah yeah so that's yeah, where yeah. like if you found one open source model that happened to include that in its training set versus one that didn't it's probably performance is going to totally destroy the one that wasn't trained on that specific language. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. All right. So moving on. Um, so this is now not talking about what's the best, but sort of just popularity. Um, so no surprise here, right? ChatGPT, GPT-4, um, and then Llama have the most mentions. I think there's just so many other models that <laughs> that it's hard for any of them to build up as many mentions. So I don't think that's a slight against these others. But if you look like at Alpaca and Vacuna, like being in mm -hmm. the vicinity of Llama, I think that's impressive. Is this the uh, first mover advantage type thing? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, let's see What's here. What's MMLU? Millions of mentions, something, something. No, no, that's where a that? benchmark, I think. Yeah, where does it say that? The y-axis. Y-axis, yeah. Yeah, vertical axis. Oh. MMLU score. Huh. Yeah, so basically this is um, saying how powerful the models are against a very broad range of tasks mm -hmm. which is not a perfect way of measuring but it's it's at least giving you a directional thing that you know dolly is not going to do as well across a wide variety of things as bakun am i misinterpreting this this thanks really pop, popularity contest at the top it talks about number of mentions not quality yeah. Right. It's kind of like, what are we interested in? What's what's hot? Yep, exactly. So previous okay. slides talked about more technical. This is what's hot. Yeah. Okay. And then, so, yeah, please. Oh, Go ahead, I was please. gonna say, I just like Googled like MMLU, and it's and I think somebody posted there. I just wanted to highlight like, um, let me put this article in the chat which not to derail but i think it's kind of interesting when they explain that so i just put it in a chat not sure if you want to pop that open so everyone can see it real quick so we can understand what that metric is mm -hmm. but yeah so it's like massive multitask language understanding so it's like a whole new metric that that's come out yeah, and actually, at this point, MMLU is a little bit old, I think. Uh, when was the MMLU paper? I even think that's an interesting statement on what's old. Like, yeah, see, six months 21. is so old. <laughs> okay. January 21. That, that's, that's, a, that's approaching that's three history, years right? old. <laughs> right? was, how was it used before? I've never even used it. Okay. So, yeah. so... Um, well, mostly it's researchers, you know, so you build, build a new LLM and then you're going to run it against what we had here. This whole, um, I don't think this is even the list of tasks. I think this is the list of, uh, this says 57 tasks. Okay. Um, but there's, there's uh, what the, whatever, different topic, the skill being tested is. And then there's, you know, tasks. So there could actually be multiple question answering tasks. There, there's knowledge tasks, there's whatever. Um, but uh, um, now I think there's a big bench or something like that, which um, MMLU is 57. I think um, 
there's these other benchmarks that have come out. And then what, what people are doing now is instead of just saying, I'm going to build a better benchmark, they just simply say, I'm going to scoop up all of your things, plus I'm going to add whatever. So basically it's like MMLU, and then someone came out with another one. And then basically the next one wasn't different. It was just a direct superset. We're going to include everything from MMLU, we're going to include everything from benchmark version two, and then we're going to call it whatever. And then the next benchmark basically just included all of those plus more. So now I think the, the benchmarks are in the vicinity of around 500 to 1,000 different tasks. It's, it's arguable whether or not it's actually really that much better of a benchmark. It looks like OpenAI is referencing their MMLU scores, though, when they are launching improvements. Pretty Maybe consistently. that's for, for backward compatibility, so you can compare it to like the GPT two scores. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, um, I can even just see if uh... Here, here's an I'll post in chat, kind of the example post that this is this is a few months ago. Um, uh, how do I get to chat on my phone? There we go. So let me see if this, oh, it's actually only more than 200. I thought it was a little bit more than that. Um, but, but we truly have entered the realm of it's hard to measure how good an LLM is, right? Do you ding it on how often it hallucinates or do you ding it on just factual accuracy or you ding it on analytical reasoning or, you know, right? So... So Ted, back on that, yeah, that slide, if you can go back one slide then. So what I said was, I was misunderstanding. So this Y coordinate is then kind of a proxy for the quality of the. Yes, model. yes. I was just oh. saying, just take it with a grain of salt. MMLU is yeah. not a perfect, but it is meant to be a uh, a yardstick of quality. Okay. And then the, it must be that the size <clears throat> of the, the dot is, is the popularity. popularity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, mean Claude, the circles mentions. Yeah, like Claude and Open Assistant are better, but not as popular. Alpaca right. is not as good, but more popular. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I forget somebody just said like like who's first? Alpaca came before most of these other ones on the chart, so it is a little bit there. There weren't that <clears throat> there weren't that many things to talk about back then. There was three or four or five, right? Now there's dozens, hundreds. Yeah, the interesting thing is that despite all that, Bard and uh, Claude do not show up here. Or do they? Am I missing those? That's interesting, yeah. Well, it's not on the chart, so it's possible that this is not a comprehensive chart. Also, it doesn't uh, say the size. I guess they all take the largest. I think they're just saying any mention of that family, regardless. No, I mean, the MMLU score can vary, right? Oh, you're right. So it's probably the MMLU score on the biggest one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's other topics. What are people talking about? I don't know if this is X or somewhere else they got it from, but you can see... Um, I think we've talked about many of these things. Um, RLHF, instruction tuning, chain of thought prompting, parameter efficient fine tuning with a typo, uh, autonomous agents, uh, emergent qualities, quantization. We haven't talked as much about inference efficiency uh, lately, I don't think. Uh, scaling laws we talked about, you guys are familiar with the Kaplan paper, and then there's been follow-ups on that. And then retrieval augmentation, I think we've touched on, we may spend some more time, maybe we'll hit up Dave to do some stuff. So these are definitely the the topics related to LLMs that, um, again, I think this is more on the research side. This is not a list of what, you know, the Washington Post has had articles about. Mm -hmm. So this comes from on the bottom left. So each of the slides has a legend. On the top right is, well, in this case, they don't have top right. On the bottom left is the source or the users or 
you know, stuff like that. So Zeta Alpha is the... Oh, okay. So this one came from Zeta Alpha, and that one, this came from Meta. And then this one, you see, they pulled from a lot of different sources. Right. They're talking and about different that... models. Yes. And, and, and actually, top... if I go out of... Uh, I thought some of these had footnotes links. Oh, you, not footnotes. You mean the 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 notes that speakers? Oh, here. Note. I think if I do download, that's that's where. Yeah. So. So you have to pull up that little uh line below the blue. No, no. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. You yeah. already had. Yeah. 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 So. So. Yeah. This slide that I was just on, now you can see um, it has actual links, not just logos. Nice. So if you guys are interested in pursuing more information, um, you can definitely go here. Uh, they're, they were good about like including more links and stuff. Yeah. And I just wanted to mention the top right legend on each slide uh, or majority of the slides. So right now you're doing language to language, but sometimes you can have, you know, text to image. So then that legend will change uh, accordingly. Anyhow, uh, just a little, a little detail for the slides. This slide didn't have any, but if you go to the next slide, it will show up again. So at the top right, you have the text to text. Uh -huh. that, yeah, text. All right. Um, this paper got some buzz. I'm not. I'm not sure if people have figured out whether they, um, whether they agree or disagree. So, um, uh, so this paper says, uh, so the idea of emergent capabilities, right, is that your LLM gets bigger, 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 and then. And then there's something equivalent to like a phase change, a state change, right? Where you get a little bit bigger and all of a sudden the performance dramatically improves on a particular um, task. That would be an emergent ability to do that task. And the paper basically said, well, if you've got sort of a bad metric and you measure it in this way, you can kind of make anything that gradually gets better look like it has a steep section. That was, I'm badly paraphrasing it, but again, read the paper if you're interested. And so there's some people who have argued that, so the paper's sort of arguing that we were measuring it in a particular way that caused a certain region to look sort of compressed. Um, uh, how would I say? No, it's like, it's like, um, Imagine you have kids that are in like first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and you're testing them on spelling, okay? And the metric you use is no spelling mistakes whatsoever in a paragraph. So you're gonna see no difference between the kids who make six spelling mistakes per paragraph and the kids who make one spelling mistake per paragraph. But you're gonna see this emergent property that all of a sudden at fifth grade, you start seeing 20%, 50% of kids are able to do a paragraph with no spelling mistakes. So the authors were kind of arguing that if your metric instead was spelling mistakes per paragraph, you might see a smooth progression from six to five to four to three to two to one to zero. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of it. So you're saying immigrant parenting is a bad metric of, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I lost you somewhere there. <laughs> So if you want to know who's going to be in the top 10 of the class, just find out who is in big paragraphs. That's what you're saying, right? Um, so, but, but yes, so, the, so they're saying that like, like if you use that as your metric, you might see very discrete looking results, but maybe there's actually a spectrum. So what if you have one immigrant and one native parent? What if you have a step parent? What, I don't know. I oh my God, stop. With this. Okay. But, but so, so that was the argument, and then I have not followed the people who are arguing back and mm. forth on Twitter or whatever, right? Saying, I mean, I think that ah, definitely makes in your sense, paper, right? You messed up, any sort and of, there really is an emergent property. Any sort of cliff could be a function of the underlying performance or a function of the metric, right? Like that, it seems almost like like non-controversial. 
that's what they were trying to say. But then there's some people who said, yeah, okay, fine. Let's try and do a better job. We still sort of see these paradigms where performance seems to not gradually increase. It seems to be dependent on a certain minimum size. And I just was not interested in following the debate. But so it's at least an interesting conversation. And if I'm sure if we go out of full screen mode, there's there's a link to the... I'd be willing to bet it's like the here. three PhDs that are like you know, highly invested in, in one direction versus the other fighting the three PhDs versus, right? Like that's the, you know, I mean, it could get yeah. pretty interesting mathematically, but it seems pretty esoteric. Uh, I will right, say this I... though, like Stanford, they invented the term foundation model and, and they seem to have won. Like <laughs> people use that now. Yeah. But I do uh, agree with what you're saying. Uh, first of all, Ted, I really liked your example uh, till... Uh, Sally put in the <laughs> hey, <it>. hey. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, I still like it. Um, though I have to say that you know, of course, you know, uh, the other way to look at it, you mentioned metric. It's also I think they mentioned about the scale how you look at it. Uh, but to to Sally's point, you know, people are still trying to chase the mathematical theory for these foundation models to work, and if they understand it better, then maybe they have a better chance to improve it more, uh, you know, ground up, if you may. So, like, there were theories about double descent and whatnot, you know, still evolving. And if you have better understanding of it, then there's a chance of improving it in a more holistic way. Yeah, so I think I think then the, the, the takeaway might be um, pay attention to that there are debates on these things, not necessarily getting wedded to a particular position. So... You know, the chinchilla paper said, hey, wait a second, guys, maybe we've been focused on more parameters and we haven't focused enough on the amount of data. Since then, I think a lot of people have focused on the quality of the data. There may not be a seminal paper in the way the chinchilla paper is, but nevertheless, it's very clear that um, if you trained small models the same way you trained big ones, you wouldn't get the performance that we're getting but people are learning other things. So you basically have to kind of rewrite your, your scaling laws, your double descent laws, all, all this stuff when you take into account the quality and the quantity of the data. All right, what else? Context length is the new parameter count. So um, obviously, depending on your task, if you're doing more chatty things or if you want to be able to shove a lot of proprietary documents into the context, then uh, you need long context. So if you have the, you know, NASA manual for how, you know, operations of your command module, and you want to answer a question on that, you really don't want to use something approximate. You'd really love to be able to shove the text right into the context and have it directly answer that. Um, and, and there's lots of research on it. So there's, right, there's stuff with um, the positioning codings that you tweak. There's, there's stuff with um, whatever, different ways of, of squishing things, summarizing, you know, whatever, um, right. to try to deal with the context that limits. And we know this week GPT-4 came out with 128K. Oh, I didn't see that. That's... Yeah, that's the dev date or GPT-4 Turbo, one of the announcements. My, yeah, my guess is if, if they're allowed to the charge turbo. more money per token, they'll, they'll, they'll build you any size you want. No, uh, actually, they, they, they reduce the cost fairly dramatically. So, yeah. yeah, it's about a third the price that it was prior. Yeah, so still, if you end up sending it 128K versus 32K, you are sending it four times data, but paying one third less, so still paying more. Yeah, <laughs> but oh, you know, got to gotta, gotta, gotta pay for all that electricity you're using, you know. Right, but but some of these, you know, the third, second bullet, that's the key is kind of coming from all angles. Like flash attention is more like engineering, right? Uh, rope, which is the rotational position encoding, which is also there in Llama too, is more the mathematical grounding on how to uh, improve the relative encoding rather than the absolute important that original papers had, right? Uh, 
so they are coming from all angles and it's interesting you know it's not just so that's what i was trying to say earlier with respect to the architectural differences as well flash attention is engineering i haven't read the alibi, alibi uh paper i know yeah uh, yannick has done a video on that uh and and also sorry to keep going back and forth flash attention originally and including one and two was targeted for training so even if you have a larger context size enabled for training, you somehow have to uh, make sure that your inferencing is efficient as well. It's not just improving the increasing the context length. If it isn't efficient, then uh, it still will be prohibitive for the companies to provide it. So the new techniques are coming from all angles and points of view. One other yeah. thing that should mention about long context is there have been studies where they have found that the context uh, not all parts of the long context are attended to fairly if you may or equally so studies found that either the beginning or the end of the context is attended to more and often the the details are lost or risk lost <laughs> lose the details if you may in the middle <laughs> just like yeah, well class. The, the, there's um, can't remember, I don't think we can't remember if we talked about it in this group, but uh, there's a particular paper, and we could have a short discussion about it another week if you guys are interested. Uh, but basically, what they found is that um, oftentimes the attention will attend to the very first token, um, and I, I liken it to sort of like a, a common reference point. So like sort of your zero coordinate or your your bias term. Um, and so what they found was that the general concept is that if you have a context of 4K and you get to the 4,001st uh, token, normally what people do is a sliding window. And so by the time you get to 5,000, you're just doing tokens 1,000 through 5,000. What they said is uh, what you should do is you should keep the first or the first few, like say the first five tokens, and then just do... Uh, tokens 1005 through 5000 and that worked much better um and so i think that's just because when when llms don't when gpt style models don't know what to attend to they often attend to the first token as just this weird default thing and so if you change the first token on it then that sort of throws things off Mm. I'd also <laughs> they mention it here. Sorry, uh, uh, Roger, just one quick point. So they don't mention it here. Uh, Llama 2 also, and many other papers, I think Google introduced that, they have what they call as the group query attention, GQA. Uh, it came from original idea of multi uh value attention or multi-query attention i don't remember exactly how it was originally uh, formulated so again there are that's another of the architectural tricks that was used in llama 2 so gqa is what was used in uh llama 2 to extend the context size from the original llama 4k to llama to 8k so be able to use that trick and not lose the context so again yeah. you know a lot of research going on there yeah, and I, I suspect there'll be slides coming up about specific inference-related things. And so there may be this grouped uh, query thing where where normally you'd have every unique query and every unique key, but you might be able to share. Um, and then I'm sure we'll talk about speculative decoding and some other things too. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, and, and I don't want to derail us with this, but i um, wondering if anybody's heard of any research down this path. Um, when I was looking at like how many uh, bytes of information. Every time I encode a token and I consider all of the um, query values, um, uh, you know, up the stack in a model, I think it was like five megabytes per token in a GPT 3.5, something like that. Which to me, if I think of all of those key values as kind of some sort of embedding that steers prediction in a particular direction, it just seemed like a, a lot of a, a large embedding, um, larger than it seemed like it seemed like it would need, and that. So I'm wondering if if any there's any research that's looking into um, doing some sort of I don't know hierarchical embedding or something where you don't have to keep the entire stack of 
query key values, um, or I guess it'd be just key values, um, for every token, you know, for all of the context window, can you summarize your context into some sort of embedding that then steers the prediction? I, yeah, I mean, like that. people are definitely trying things along those lines to say like, okay, if my max context length is, let's say 4,000, okay, by the time I'm getting close to that, when I'm at 3,900, right, is there a way I can take these 3,000 and squish them into 1,000 and then and then I can now I have 2,000 you know, extra tokens, right? And then when I get close again, I can repeat that process, right? So that would be something kind of along your lines. Um, but but yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, when you talk about like the five megabytes, right? So if your embedding size uh, of your model, your D model is let's say 10,000, then I don't know what they're using. 16-bit floats or 32-bit floats or whatever, but then every token becomes um, 10,000 uh, numbers, right? And yeah. if you have 48 layers, then it's 48 times 10,000. And even right. though it's a residual stream and that the value may not change that much per layer, you're still keeping track of each one separately. And so right. it's... Right. Whereas, if like in the original Transformer, you had the encoder decoder model so you had the encoder side in that example didn't they it was just was it just the final um value that was you the uh, decoder could attend to yes in the original vaswani paper yeah. uh if it was 12 layers then the 12th is the the best encoder and right. so you use that one and you feed it into the cross attention of all decoder layers right right and Roger, what you mentioned has been done, and I'm sure you know there is research going on to see how it can be uh, used in the newer uh, LLM era. So when Bert came out and Roberta and all those models were coming out in the, uh, in, from the research uh, places, uh, there was this thing that came out from Germany. I think it was uh, Germany, I think, German lab, uh, called Sentence Bert. So the idea was what you're saying. Well, you know, to some extent, not to rely on the last layer, but maybe it's either a combination of the CLS token from the last penultimate layer or a mean of last four layers, but except the last layer, right? Mm -hmm. And so on. Because so, CLS is, in some ways, uh, the CLS token, which is the classification token, right? Uh, if you remember the BERT architecture from uh, five years or six years ago now. Uh, so... So essentially, the idea was, well, if we have a representation of this entire sentence, can can that be used for whatever use cases and tasks right. it can be right. used for? Right? So in some sense, yes, uh, it has been tried and successfully used as well in many uh, tasks. So I, I hear you. But there's another uh, flow that is very widely used, uh, leveraging LangChain or these uh, other... Uh, <sighs> Uh, connected LLMs as the central operator uh, packages, right? Uh, like bots and all. So mm -hmm. what they do is they chunk your large context into subcontexts and then summarize those subcontexts into, uh, to your point, you know, like uh, uh, maybe either embeddings only or they change it to text and then use that and pass it along to the next chunk and so on and so forth. Uh, and people are trying all kinds of things, but I think what you are referring to is within the within the uh, within the uh, network itself, right? Not yeah, necessarily. it kind of. Although, um, yeah, summarizing into especially if you summarize into the embedding as opposed to summarizing into text would be closer to what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. All right, just took a quick peek. So eventually it talks about things other than LLMs, but there's 70 <laughs> slides on uh, on research and we're on slide 23. So okay, uh, we, we, we can just decide do we wanna keep going or what we wanna do in terms of pacing. I'm certainly done uh, with that question, so. All right, let's see here. Loss in the middle, long context, mostly don't live up to the expectations. Uh, this is what we just discussed, right? The 
the de- lost in the details in the middle. <laughs> okay. So even though attention allows you to see every single unique token. So if you do a 32K model, it has all 32,000 previous tokens and it can attend to any of them. But that doesn't necessarily mean it learns how to accurately attend to all of them. Is that a is that a way of paraphrasing it, Dave? That's part of it. And I think the middle bullet is even more strong. They also found that model performance decreased as input length decreased. So increased. it's not, yeah, or oh, increase, my bad, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That, that, to me, that seems a little bit intuitive in, in that having a flat attention over a long context kind of seems like it would raise the noise level because you're attending to everything and it's harder yeah. for the important thing to stand out. I'm thinking about way back when taking the SATs and they give you this this thing and it's like four paragraphs, you have to read that and then answer some questions. Like giving you instead of four paragraphs, 60 paragraphs is not going to improve your performance right. on those SAT questions. Yeah, yeah. Let's see here, keeping up with the high memory demand. So there's flash attention and flash attention two, which uh, Dave mentioned. So these guys uh, are exact versions of attention. It's just a different ordering grouping of the operations performed. So this is basically a freebie. You get better performance and you don't have to sacrifice anything. It's the same exact mathematical calculation. Uh, we definitely see uh, reducing the number of bits. Um, okay, so here's the first mention of speculative decoding. Um, are you guys familiar with speculative coding? I don't know the exact details of the implementation, but I can give you the high level picture. Please do. Um, so let's say you've got a case where you really want to use GPT-4, okay? You you want to use some big model, okay? Um, and it's going to be expensive to do inference. So uh, the way inference works is you give it the context, and it predicts one token. It doesn't predict two, four, 10, 20. It only predicts one, okay? Once you have that token, then you, um, uh, you, you, you have a context that's one longer, you pass that in, and now you get the next token. And if you're clever, you can do some caching and things like that. But basically you have to do one inference pass for every token that you add. And you know, a typical output, even if it's just one short sentence might be say, 20 tokens, okay? Uh, what you can do instead is if you are able to guess what the next five tokens are going to be, okay, you can give it all five of them. And the way GPT style models work is that it'll predict all of the words, including the ones for those five positions that you just gave it. And so you can actually check to see if you were wrong on any of them. So what you do is you use a smaller LLM that's much cheaper for inference, and you have it do five tokens, eight tokens, whatever. And then you pass all eight of those in as the prompt, and but you're not just getting the next token out of it. You're also double-checking whether it agreed with the last eight tokens that you just added. And if it disagrees, then you have to back up to where it disagreed, and you have to start over again. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so this relies... Thank you, Ted. Yeah, that was good explanation. So it relies on the fact that the smaller model is not too, not incorrect many times. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So, so there's not really any benefit to doing speculative decoding a hundred tokens out, because <laughs> now you're paying a hundred inferences on the smaller model, and you're probably going to end up backing up at some point. Right, so five tokens is a good example. So let's say for five tokens, let's take five as the number and it says two to three times uh, inference speed up. So that means half the times it has to back up on an average. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And I don't, what I don't know is the details of when you back up. Is it is it a certain difference in the logits or if it's a completely different, or I, I, I don't, okay. Um, and also you have to think about what what kind of inferencing are you doing? If you're doing if you're doing greedy decoding and you're only taking the most probable token 
then my guess is you can get more of a speed up because you just need to know, do we agree fairly closely on the most likely token? If you're doing sampling, okay, um, you know, if you do top K sampling or something like that, now you have to agree on more than just the top token. And so you probably have are going to have conditions where you disagree that that crop up more often. So um, you'd have generally speaking for something like chat bots, you don't want greedy decoding because they make very boring repetitive mm -hmm. text. And so my guess is speculative decoding doesn't give you as much when you're in creative mode, but you know how like you can choose like most accurate, most creative, whatever. So you probably get the biggest bang for your buck when users say they want most accurate, uh, then you can probably crank up your speculative decoding. So Ted, I might've missed it when you're just describing it there, but when you are doing sampling um, and yeah. in the small model, and then you come back, you said you check it. So when you're doing sampling, there's like, a, there's a distribution, right? So it's not a right or wrong. It's that was kind of a good choice or it wasn't a good choice, it really wasn't it. it. So can you do the same technique and just use that as a an imprecise accuracy prediction? You, you, you can, I, I just, I, that, this is where I don't know the gory details of how people choose to do the implementation. So let's okay. use the simplest case. Let's say you're doing top K sampling, okay? And you set K equal to four, okay? So you're saying, I'm, I'm going to take the four most likely tokens, and then I'm gonna choose a random number, and I'm gonna pick one of those four based on their, their probabilities, based on their logics, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you're doing speculative decoding, what you would want is you'd wanna compare the top four tokens from the small LLM, the cheap one, Mm -hmm. to the top four from the big one and have some gotcha. metric for when they're close enough or not. And if gotcha. they're not close enough, then you back up. So gotcha. you can imagine that's going to flag that you, that they're not close enough and you need to back up much more often than if you're doing greedy and you're just doing top one sampling. Possibly, yeah. Right? I, I mean, I'm not saying Certainly. how much more, but it, it can't... It can't disagree less. <laughs> it, ha it can only disagree yeah. more when you're yeah. considering more tokens that might have different probabilities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then swarm parallelism. Uh, I'm not too familiar with this. I don't know if you're anybody else is familiar. If it's worth discussing, I get the gist of it that you know you run in parallel on a lot of small devices and then you aggregate i think it's more like federation federated training or something yeah and i don't know if this is for training or inference oh high training throughput got it yeah so so this maybe you know like vast and other companies are also you know they uh lend out gpus so yeah maybe of interest in that regard yeah and maybe there's some way you can just sort of simulate massively large batch sizes or something like that. Yeah. Let's see here. Can small with good data relevant big? Oh, so we've started talking about this, right? Um, the idea is data quality, not like number of parameters. Um, I like the that. The fact that these models' weights are sparse. Right, people have been trying to do distillation. So, like conceptually, uh, even the 175 billion parameter model may not have more than seven, 13 billion truly useful parameters. But that doesn't mean that you can actually build a seven billion model and have it be completely packed dense without having uh, the same, you know, sparse issues with in terms of being overparameterized. Sorry, Dave or somebody, you're going to say something. Yes, yeah, so I think there was a, yeah, they have the mention in the last bullet, right? Fee 1.5. So this is all Microsoft. It came out from Microsoft. So there was fee one or five one. I don't know, whatever you want to pronounce it as. So all they did was, uh, there was a paper called textbooks is all you need. So fee one was essentially trained on just textbooks and it apparently did pretty good. And it was a 1 billion or uh, mm -hmm. like very small uh, model. And uh yes people are trying all kinds of things to see essentially yeah i mean sorry dave 
Yeah, um, no, I, I was just—I was just going to say as a side comment: if you think about the internet, the the factual density, the factual quality, and the grammatical quality on the internet isn't that high. So if you actually trained it on like textbooks or or some other much more curated language, you could get a really different signal to noise, you know, ratio, a really different like grammatical sentence quality thing. Unfortunately, you still need some kind of variety. I, I you know, textbooks I think would give you if you used only textbooks to train and you had a chatbot, I, I hate to think the way that chatbot's going to talk to you. Yeah, your, your vocabulary will improve. <laughs> you, you know what I've been actually exploring, like with what you were saying, is with the actual prompt engineering and being very direct. So I was reading an article like a couple of weeks ago on how to avoid hallucinations. And it was saying, be very uh, precise, but then you can actually specify where you want, you know, in your prompt, the information to come from. If you know that there are some respected sites, like if there are some, you know, particular, you know, websites that generally, you know, have good content or different newspapers or whatever it is you're running, just be precise and tell it to only pull from the sites that you know you trust, and then it'll only train on that. And when I started being more precise, I found like I was getting better results because it wasn't doing its own thing. It, it like, listen, okay, I'm only going to go here. And that was just, you know, adding that um, preciseness in my prompt. So Christy, you're saying that this is um, a prompt engineering technique then? It's not a training thing. It's just during the prompting? Well, I'm saying that you can get some interest. I, when I was exploring, like I'll, I'll give an example um, of what the use case I was actually doing. I was, I use it more from an enterprise perspective, not just because I want to like, not my own interest at the point, at this point, just from an enterprise. So I had um, all of this data on comments and I was trying to test out um, some things and, and reference things from the internet. And all kinds of things was returning back, not what I wanted. And then I was just looking online, like, okay, how do you get it to be more precise? And it was saying, um, tell it in the prompt, tell it to be precise. Um, if you don't want it to return data, tell it. Like, and I saw some examples and I was like, okay, I will be precise, you know, only pull from this site or that site. And it, did it narrowed it down and I got better results and so I know that there's a tuning aspect can you give a precise example Christine so you, so you wrote a prompt that said is Trump a good person and only use the Washington Post or something like that and like so it's it's at runtime not at training time uh yeah I mean I mean that's one example like if because exactly what you said in your prompt like being that precise because at first when I got started I wasn't really, I'm not an expert in prompt engineering. I will start off by saying that. Um, so, I mean, I think it takes a, a long time to, you know, to really build up that skill set. But um, what I found was, you know, go ahead and be, I learned that, you know, be exactly precise with it. So let me, let me try to pull up like one of the models that I was working hey, with. And let me try to give an example, like exactly what, okay. So I was doing one, okay, I'm gonna read like what I had. I was doing one that was like financial headlines and um, I was instructed to just, just tell it what you want. And I was like, okay, determine, this was the prompt, determine whether each topic of the following list of topics is covered in the financial news article provided. And I gave it a list of topics. I was like Fed and central banks, company, product news, corporate, debt, earnings, like, you know, just basic things, politics, stock um, movement. Then I was, I told you exactly how to format it. And I was like, format your response to JSON object with each topic as keys and zero and or one as values. And 
And I was like, and the other key to list potential topics not listed above, use an array as a value. Like I was like completely specific as if I was talking to like an employee and telling them exactly how I want it. Or if think about when you're ordering a meal and you're like, okay, I want a hamburger. I want pickles. I don't want cheese. I was, I've been learning to do that and it's been generating the exact thing that I want, but I didn't know to be that specific in the prompt. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense from the prompt engineering perspective, but I thought you mentioned telling it which sites. Oh yeah, oh, these were a couple, I'm sorry. I was explaining a couple different um, things I was exploring. So I've been exploring a couple different things, um, but yeah, that was one model. So if you're saying which sites to use, then are you talking about Bing? Because most LLMs don't have internet access. So that was just an example um, that I was read, you know, like, hey, tell it exactly where to go, where to find it. Um, but the one that I built, I built a couple of them. And the one that I was just reading was more specific. It was, I took an article from like um, one of the financial headlines and I was telling it to be specific, to actually categorize like product, news, corporate debt. I wanted it to go through the text. I wanted it to categorize according to those topics. And then the last part, I told it exactly the format. I wanted to give me like a JSON object. And I had mentioned that. And then I said, okay, return a zero or return a one. And I was like, very, very specific by it. And then I gave some examples. Okay, thanks. So um, getting back to sort of just the, the whole report. Um, so it's the top of the hour. Uh, we should we should wrap up for today okay. here.